Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Renato Lacerda, and I am a postdoctoral researcher at the Universidade de São Paulo. I will, be, I will be hosting today's talk at Abralinha Ao Vivo, Linguists Online, which is an initiative of the Brazilian Linguistics Association. Today, we have the great honor of having Professor Susie Wumbrand, who is a researcher at the University of Vienna and a visiting professor at Harvard University, previously held positions at McGill University and the University of Connecticut. Professor Susie Wumbrand obtained her PhD in 1998 at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and has since become a leading name in theoretical linguistics, having done work on a variety of topics at the Syntax Semantics Interface and having published in several top tier venues. She is also the editor in chief of the Journal of Comparative Germanic Linguistics, co editor of the series Open Generative Syntax, and associate editor of the journal Language. And her great contribution to the field has been recently acknowledged by a two volume fast shrift at KDG. Today, she will give us the talk from prolapsus to hyperase. And before we start, I would just like to remind the audience that they can write their questions in the chat and we'll get them in the end. Seva Suzy, thank you very much for being here today and sharing your work with us. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. You may start on your presentation whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, so thank you very much, Renato, for this uh, lovely uh, introduction. Um, I will share my screen. I should say that the handout is available on the Abralin uh, homepage, as well as I just uh, posted it, uh, a link to it on my Facebook page. Um, the handout is long and there is lots of data, so you may want to scroll back and forth. So it may be useful for you to have the handout um, handy. Um, the talk is co-authored with two of my um, research associates, um, Eva Kovac and Magdalena Loninger. And it's um, still work in progress, but um, we are quite excited um, that we are able to present this here. Um, first of all, the Brazilian Linguistic Association um, knows about hyper-raising a lot, um, but it's also something we have been working for a while um, and now been able to put a lot of uh, things together. So um, what we are going to look at, just a very, very um, brief introduction, is uh, sentences like one. Um, the first one is not possible in English. Nova seems that like salad, but it is in many other languages. Um, and the second one, I believe, of Nova that she likes salad. Um, those reflect certain case agreement and A movement dependencies. Um, this, the first one is a case of raising, raising to object, or would be if it was grammatical. And the second one is a case of prolepsis. Um, so for case agreement, it's pretty clear. A movement, um, we refer to things like raising to subject, raising to object, um, but also uh, long distance agreement for um, a movement. And in particular, what's going to be relevant here is um, these kind of configurations across a finite clause boundary. Now, uh, if we just look at English, the two constructions look pretty different, not just because one is grammatical and the other isn't. But if we move away from English-like languages, then the distinction becomes much harder. Uh, in many languages, instead of a PP, you can actually have um, an object, an accusative phrase, for instance. And um, the distinctions are not always easy to draw. Moreover, when we look at diagnostics, they often cannot be compared directly across languages. So the domain that we'll be targeting in this talk is given as the domain fracture A. Um, so this, this beautiful uh, script, which I haven't found an English translation for. Um, configurations in which a matrix element, and that could be an argument, an argument position, a case assigner, an agreement head, is in an obligatory dependency with an element um, in an embedded finite clause. And the dependencies too can be very diverse, um, agree, movement, binding, uh, predication, and the elements we are talking about also come in a range, um, operators, argument, positions, uh, bound pronouns, gaps, uh, et cetera. So it's a broad definition, but we'll see later why it's relevant. Um, 
but to sort of start already in addition to these kind of hyper raising configurations um, this definition also covers prolepsis um, and uh, this is the case because in prolepsis the pronoun is obligatorily um, related to the off phrase here. So if we leave it out, I believe off over that like salad, um, that, that's uh, bad. Um, so prolepsis in principle also uh, control would be under this definition, but um, we are not going to cover this in this talk. Not um, of concern here are pure A bar relations, the wh movement, relativization, etc. since there the matrix element would be in an A bar dependency unless it's fed by a prior fracture A dependency. Um, now, uh, also not variable binding, even if it occurs from an A position, because variable binding is not obligatory. Every bird is convinced that her uh, owner is lazy, her can also receive um, a referential interpretation. Um, so one thing uh, before we go on, which will become later as well, become important later, the the A configurations, uh, I'm not going to call them fracture A from now on, just A configurations, they themselves are not obligatory. Um, so you never have to use prolepsis. You can also just say, I believe that Nova likes salad. But when such a, such a configuration is used, then there is an obligatory A dependency here. Um, Okay, so what are we going to do? We are going to look at the characteristic properties. And in particular, we have sorted through a range of properties and have uh, uh, come up with four properties that are relevant cross-linguistically. Productivity, island sensitivity, A minimality, and semantic restrictions. Um, and what we're going to do in this talk is that we're going to show, in contrast to previous approaches, that the distinction between prolepsis and hyperraising or long distance agreement is not just a binary uh, distinction, but is really a continuum. And in particular, we'll, we'll show that there are, when we use these characterizing properties, that there are five types of constructions. You see those here. Um, and then we'll suggest an implementation, which uh, makes use of different base positions, different properties of C, which may bundle um, certain properties, and different probing mechanisms. So this is the empirical landscape. Um, I hope that you are a little overwhelmed by just looking at this. Um, we worked for a very long time on this, but our goal will it be um, to go through this table, to show you this table, to illustrate all the constructions and properties, and then show you why the direction we suggest um, seems to work best with this entire um, empirical landscape of the A configurations. Um, we have given here some names that you may have heard, prolepsis, um, um, uh, major subject, subject, uh, object raising, long distance agreement, hyper ECM, hyper raising, etc. Um, those are not essential. And we have given here the languages that we feel fairly confident about. The gray ones are the ones where we do not have all the properties yet uh, and aren't fully able to put them in the right uh, cells here. So like Turkish may either be here or here. Um, and we, we just haven't been able to figure that out yet. Um, and for Uger, we don't have all the data, but for all the others, we feel pretty confident that this is the, the right classification. Okay, so you will see this table a lot, um, but what I wanna draw your attention to already now is that uh, this beautiful uh, uh, color representation, which shows you that it's not just a yes, no type of, um, uh, configuration here for certain properties, but that we do need indeed um, the various configurations here. All right, so I want to start with prolepsis, um, not because we have a lot to say about prolepsis. Everything we're going to say here is essentially from the literature, but it serves as a very good baseline for what we are going to compare it with then later. So, um, General description is that uh, prolepsis refers to configurations in which a DP in the matrix clause, which is often introduced by a preposition, obligatorily corresponds to a co-referent uh, pronominal or maybe a variable in the embedded clause. In some cases, the pronoun may be missing if it can be understood implicitly. But um, for now, we'll just work with this obligatory definition. We'll call the proleptic DP, DP factor A. Um, and um, um, as a 
just as a general description, the bound element can be anywhere in the embedded clause. Um, so here's an example where you see again that you can't have the pronoun missing. No one knows about Danny that Leo would bring salad soon. The him has to be uh, there. Um, this is an example from Davis. Uh, and here you see examples where the pronoun occupies all sorts of different grammatical functions. So there's no restriction to subject or, or anything. Um, properties of prolepsis. Again, languages differ somewhat in, in details, but overall, these are the properties that people uh, have shared and do seem to agree on. First property is that prolepsis is productive. Um, it's possible in basically any context where a full propositional CP could occur. Um, but again, uh, there may be preferences for certain types of uh, contexts, but overall, there is no particular type of verb class that goes with prolepsis. In German, um, Salzmann gives examples where prolepsis can also occur with uh, a CP complement to an adjective or a noun. It's not restricted to particular matrix predicates, um, but there can be case restrictions if DPA receives structural case in a language, obviously. Um, DPA is in the matrix clause, but it does not receive a data role from the matrix verb, with one exception perhaps in this purse. Um, so for instance, here's an example from German with the matrix verb seem, and you can see that prolepsis is uh, possible. Everyone has a dream of which um, uh, it seems that it will never become true. Um, now, I was told in English this doesn't work so well, but in German, this is actually a corpus example, and uh, I find it totally natural. Um, furthermore, DPA um, and the dependency with an operator or the pronoun is unbounded and not sensitive to islands. Um, there's more examples coming later, but here are some again from the literature. I believe about Richard that he and Linda are in trouble, so coordinate structure. I believe about 18 that the story that she captured the thief is untrue. Um, those seem to all be okay. And lastly, there are semantic restrictions um, put simply, uh, DPA must be referential or if it's a quantifier specific or generic. Um, so for instance, here are some examples from English and the same in German. I know of firemen that they are available that only receives a generic interpretation. Um, and here, if you take the sentence without prolapses, Nova said that she's looking for a secretary. That could be, she's just looking for any type of secretary. Um, but if it's prolapses, Nova said of a secretary that she's looking for him, then she's looking for a specific uh, secretary here. Um, and uh, the same is the case, for instance, in this Paris. Here is a context where Mary is a um, babysitter uh, is taking care of twins and then one twin disappears, but she doesn't know which of the twins because they look alike. Um, Mary got scared because she thought one of the twins was missing. If it's prolepsis, Mary thought of one of the twins that uh, the twin is missing, then that's not possible in the context where she um, uh, so this sentence is not prolepsis. This is possible in this context. And here, this sentence has prolepsis. The accusative is in the matrix clause. I've, I've um, bracketed the embedded clause here. Um, and in this context, the sentence is not possible. Semantic restrictions are, um, according to at least uh, a subpart of the literature, also responsible for the fact that uh, embedded idioms, uh, that uh, DPAs that are part of an embedded idiom don't usually work that well. Kelsey believed about the cat that it would be out of the bag, um, does not get the, the uh, idiomatic interpretation because uh, Kelsey would have to have a belief about a specific cat, which doesn't go with the idiom. That property is sort of the unclearest and there is lots of variation across speakers. Um, it's, it's not a very sharp property. So for instance, uh, Salzman gives an example, example what to swing the speech. Um, so swing is like, you know, lasso speech, uh, lasso swing. Uh, and you do that with a speech. He, this was given okay uh, for him. Uh, I, I don't think it's particularly good, but there is some, some gray area here. Okay, so what are the accounts out there for prolapses? 
Uh, Salzman has a beautiful overview article on prolapses, which I recommend highly. Um, and what he suggests is that DPA is the subject of a predicative CP. Um, the, uh, the propositional CP is turned into a predicate by a base generated operator. Um, so the essential uh, dependency is predication between DPA and the CP. Landau, who looks at copy raising, which is very similar to prolapsis. Um, I can say something about this later. Um, so he, he also uh, suggests that the semantic restrictions are the result of predication. Only referential elements may saturate predicates, um, and that also excludes the, the, the idiom parts. Takano, um, DPA may be a major object. There is an aboutness condition, and he speculates that matrix predicate selects a theme rim relation. Um, uh, so very similar again. And uh, Yoon, DPA in Korean is subject to a major subject requirement, uh, which similarly leads to specificity and preferentiality uh, restrictions. Now, the specific restrictions may vary uh, across languages, but overall they fall in the same kind of semantic ballpark. So what we are going to do is we built on these approaches and just make some minor uh, modifications. Um, we followed then Dickin in assuming that predication is done via a relator phrase. Um, so R uh, corresponds to a relator head, which relates its specifier um, and the complement via predication. So in prolepsis, the CP is um, a predicate. Um, it has an open um, uh, slot, uh, which has been created via the operator. And then this DP is the subject of this predication relation, which we treat as an A dependency, um, and it saturates the CP. So overall, the RP here uh, becomes a proposition again. So here are now the four properties that we'll be talking about uh, in this talk, uh, labeled A, A to D. Um, for prolepsis, there is no restriction to matrix predicates. Um, and um, the idea here is following Salzman that this RP is not selected. It's not um, a complement. The verb only wants a proposition, and the proposition can either be a CP if it doesn't have an operator in it, so a fully saturated CP, or an RP, which is, again, a fully saturated um, proposition. Uh, R relates the specifier and the complement. Um, this is an A position, um, no selection. Um, and generally, verbs selecting a proposition can combine with an RP. So in a sense, we want to say that RP is fairly free, though there could, of course, be language-specific restrictions. Um, B, no island sensitivity. Um, now, the CP, he, there is no dependency um, going between the, the original position, the gap, the pronoun position, and DPA. But that is established, as we'll show later, via an unselective binding relation between the operator and the pronoun here. So there is no movement. That's the, the, the basic observation here. There is no movement. For Salzmann, there is actually a silent NP, which is uh, undergoing ellipsis, which we can see as the underlying structure of pronouns, in fact, following Sauerland and other people. Uh, so there is no movement, hence no uh, issue of locality. Um, uh, the operator identifies with the pronoun via unselective binding. Um, and connectivity is an interesting property because prolepsis appears to have some apparent um, uh, connectivity effects, reconstruction effects. But as Salzman shows, this can be handled via a more refined structure of pronouns and not uh, via movement. Um, there is no A minimality. This will become relevant later. And the semantic restrictions, as I said already, uh, they are imposed by R following the approaches, Landau, et cetera, that R um, imposes this, uh, or mediates the, the predication relation, and R can uh, be associated with more specific semantic properties as well. Um, all right. So uh, the prolapses could be further distinguished, um, but 
we are not going to do this here. I just want to say it so that it's said once. Um, there is no uniformity across languages. In fact, for any of the A constructions we talk about regarding the position of DPA with respect to the matrix verb. Um, in some languages, it obligatorily is, it is obligatorily below the verb, in some above it, in others, uh, it's flexible. So in, in all languages, independently of the overt position, uh, it appears to take scope over the matrix verb, um, which may, however, be related to the semantic restrictions. Um, so nothing in our account requires nor prohibits further movement of overt, uh, overt or covert A movement of DPA, um, and that seems to correctly reflect the cross-linguistic uh, distribution. So it may happen, and it may even be distinguishing between languages, uh, like Victoria Chen has suggested uh, in Majuris, the, the uh, DPA uh, occurs higher up than in Puyuma, for instance, but it is essentially orthogonal to the typology of um, uh, the domain A because it's a language specific property. And I'm going to skip this first here. If there are uh, questions in the audience about it, I can come back to it. So um, this is the summary for prolepsis. You now see the parts that have been discussed in this curl, I believe it is color. Uh, and what we haven't discussed uh, is still gray. Um, I will now switch to um, a presentation where we go through the properties and not through uh, the different constructions. That will be more informative. Um, all right, so all the other constructions, so prolepsis number two and the number one, excuse me, and then two to five are what we call cross class of A dependencies. Um, because in these cases, in all of these four constructions, there is actually an actual A dependency uh, spanning a finite clause boundary. And that could be an agree dependency, a movement dependency, a case dependency, anything um, A related. But it really goes across um, this clause boundary. For prolepsis, we only had predication with the entire CP, but um, no dependency going across it. Um, so we'll call these CC factor A. Um, and before we go, get into the details, I want to give you an overview of the constructions. I know that if you're not working on that, um, it takes a while to get into this. So here are some data uh, just so that you get a sense of the empirical landscape again. Starting with our favorite language today, Brazilian Portuguese, um, there is one construction which we'll call high topic. Um, where we have a raising verb, which does not assign a theta rule, um, and then a, an argument which agrees with it. So the boys seem, plural, uh, then a finite clause that they traveled yesterday. So there's this they, which is um, a pronoun, which is uh, repeated here. This may, of course, you may think this looks like prolepsis, but we'll see in the course of the presentation that it is a different construction. Um, Korean uh, type, three construction, raising to object. Um, here again, we have accusative, which is assigned by the matrix verb out of a finite clause. Um, then we have long distance agreement in CES. Uh, embedded clause, it, the object uh, position can agree with the matrix verb. There are certain conditions for that, but um, you can see the, the proper marked uh, relation here. Um, then we have Romanian, also a case of uh, RTO. Uh, smell has a has a figurative meaning. I figured out about um, so uh, I uh, the clinic stuff going on in Romanian. Uh, I smelled uh, about Victor uh, that he's happy, um, and this is clearly in the matrix clause. It gets differential object marking, uh, etc. Then we are back to Brazilian Portuguese has also a construction five. Um, and it's the same as the example we just saw, except that the pronoun is missing here. And of course, you may ask, well, how can we distinguish that? Yes, that's what uh, these works are doing. Uh, and we will give you a glimpse into uh, the excellent tests that have been developed. Um, Zulu, also type five. Um, subject raising, uh, object raising, raising to object and uh, raising to subject. So I want um, uh, Stifo that cooks an egg and uh, similar seems that um, makes, uh, will make steamed bread. Um, so 
um, similar constructions. And lastly, we have a very, very cool construction in this purse, covert uh, raising to object. Um, in the embedded clause, we have an argument here it's the children that shows object agreement with the matrix verb, but it is really raising to object because the agreement here then changes the case pattern of the matrix subject. Um, it really turns the matrix verb into a transitive verb, which is why we get ergative. If there was no agreement, uh, the matrix subject would get absolutive. Um, so covert raising to object, um, which we see here via the agreement marker. All right, so let's go to distinction one, now becoming green. Um, prolepsis differs from all the other constructions in um, being much freer available than uh, constructions two to five. Um, it is mentioned in a lot of the literature that this is the case, but um, I should admit that we haven't been able to find real minimal pairs. Um, but um, in the appendix, you find a summary of all the claims that have been made about these constructions, about which verbs uh, allow them and which don't. So the class of CCA constructions um, shows restrictions within languages and across languages. So for instance, in many languages, speech verbs like say are not compatible with CCA. However, that's not generally the case. Buryat, Mongolian, and Uyghur allow CCA also in these contexts. Um, uh, and I've, uh, I'm illustrating that here, Mongolian, Mongolian and Uyghur. You see here in the embedded clause an idiom. Um, an idiom in the embedded clause uh, is evidence that this phrase here starts out or is associated, <clears throat> excuse me, with the lower predicate. So here we have the bats I um, climbed to the top for being surprised. Um, and it shows accusative case. Just one second, sorry. So it shows accusative case or nominative case. Um, and the meaning does not change. So in both constructions, the idiomatic reading is available. <coughs> um, and the matrix verb is say here. So this um, can be taken as indication that um, hyper raising or raising to object in this case under say is possible. And similarly in Uyghur, nine girls labor um, um, for something being very hard can also occur with accusative. But when we switch to Nest Purse, for instance, um, we have here a construction with the verb think, um, which can have the, subject, the embedded subject either in the matrix clause, which could be prolapses or movement, or in the embedded clause, which is the covert RTO construction that I mentioned. So that works with think. But if we go to matrix verb say, um, the accusative here is possible, but the only meaning it can get is like the goal argument. I told Harold, blah, blah, blah. It cannot have the meaning um, uh, Angel said about Harold or Angel said that Harold. It just doesn't have that meaning. And um, Deal has uh, concluded that verbs like say do not allow um, hyper raising in uh, this person. So cross-linguistically, there is a clear tendency. The verbs that allow CCA involve verbs of knowledge, belief, and perception. Um, and here's just one more illustration from Japanese. Um, the summary, as I said, is in the appendix. Um, Japanese, the literature shows a lot of conflicting claims about which types of verbs allow uh, prolapses and or RTO. And one reason is that the two constructions are not always distinguishable. Um, so for instance, Hoji and Kobayashi and Maki have suggested that um, uh, DPA constructions are highly productive. They can occur with any CP complement. There's no lexical selection. But um, Horn in a very interesting dissertation uh, pointed out that there are restrictions, but nevertheless, the class is clearly much larger than English ECM. So even after these restrictions are taken into account, there are 276 verbs that allow this um, accusative construction. Now, um, it's very difficult to distinguish prolapses and RTO, um, but Koji Shimamura has pointed out one property, which is not accepted by, by all speakers, 
um, namely case stacking. So for some speakers, it's possible in a, a potential construction to have a dative subject um, and the nominative object, but then the dative subject can have an additional nominative stack to it. Now, for Japanese speakers who don't like this construction, uh, everything is basically irrelevant here, but uh, speakers who do like this construction, we can embed this in an uh, RTO context. So think, uh, Taro, think, uh, or thought, or it's, think, it's thinking um, that Hanako um, can speak English. And what you see here is a really cool property, namely that in addition to the accusative, which uh, I think everyone accepts, which is the RTO accusative, um, dative could also be used. And that um, uh, clearly points to a location of this phrase originating in the embedded clause because the dative can only come from the potential construction here. Now, if we change the matrix verb to something like say, then this gets really, much worse. And if we change to something like conclude or assert, the dative is entirely impossible. So once again, this, this shows that the class that allows prolepsis, because the accusative is compatible with prolepsis, um, but only the dative would be compatible with the RTO construction. Um, so the RTO construction is a smaller class than the prolepsis class. So what are we going to do? Um, we are suggesting that uh, the configurations in 225 all involve a special CP. And we're going to call it CPR because it rescues various properties. Um, so the idea is that if you look here again at the structure for prolepsis, prolepsis has an RP and a CP. Uh, what we are suggesting is that um, in some languages and some constructions, um, uh, it is possible to bundle these projections in one projection. This is similar to bundling of the IP, for instance, where tense and agreement are bundled um, in, in some languages. So uh, this bundled CPR, CR, um, is not available in all languages. Um, and even within some languages, there is uh, lexical restrictions that are imposed uh, by the verb. English, for instance, you can only have the spread out version here. You cannot have the bundled version. Um, so in contrast to RP, which is fairly unrestricted, CPR, again, is selected. Um, now, um, CPR to the rescue, uh, C and R combines the properties of R and C. Um, uh, the R property is the predication property, the relator property that relates an argument um, and a predicate. And uh, the C properties are uh, uh, C properties like topic, focus, and whatever else you may have in the CP. Um, so in that sense, this uh, functions as a composite probe, as uh, von Urk has suggested. But we have now given meaning and function to uh, these elements here. So CR combines semantically with a predicate. Um, so a TP that has a, a, a gap in it um, or has an open uh, spot in it. Um, and it establishes the predication relation between the argument in its specifier and its complement. Um, Note that this is now what makes this an, R, an A relation. Um, even although the DP is in the, in the CP, it is an argument because it establishes this predication relation. So by building the R relation into the CP, uh, we have essentially created an A position here, but only for the element that actually enters the predication relation. If there is something else here, something scrambled, for instance, that element will not be in an argument position, but in a regular A bar position. Um, okay, and C can contribute various other flavors. So um, this, as, as I said, rescues what has been called improper uh, things. Um, um, there's a constraint, um, namely that A dependencies uh, cannot follow pure A bar dependencies. Um, uh, we want to apply this to all A dependencies. So you can't assign case to an A bar position. You can't agree with an A bar, pure A bar position, and you can't uh, A move from a pure A bar uh, position. Now, we neither endorse, derive, nor worry about this constraint. Uh, I know many people don't like the constraint. 
we don't care. Um, uh, it's really a diagnostic, basically, that um, um, when there is an A dependency involved, then we want to say that this position has uh, A properties. And there's an interesting footnote about yet another Brazilian Portuguese construction, which we won't cover in the talk, but have here for the interested reader. OK, so this is the picture. Um, Prolepsis, uh, RP is a proposition, CP here is a predicate. Um, CPR, the entire thing is a proposition, but um, I guess C bar would be a, a predicate. Um, and this, this kind of relation, so the, the, the uh, predication relation is the same in, in both constructions. It's an A dependency predication. And um, due to C CPR, um, the DPA uh, position here, if it has undergone predication, can then undergo further A dependencies, such as movement agreement with something in the matrix class. So that's the common analysis uh, of the so CPR is the common factor of all two to five constructions. And the common factor of all constructions is this R element. Um, and we think that this is right. And it also reflects the difficulty and the similarities that even prolepsis has with uh, things like hyper racing. All right, so we are now um, uh, distinction B, movement. Um, and here you now see that we get the second uh, different type of uh, split, namely one and two prolepsis and high topic construction patterned together against three, four, and five. Um, um, so the type of properties that um, uh, we are going to talk about our island sensitivity and connectivity effects, and then we are going to uh, uh, sum up why that is the case. So um, constructions three to five, um, constructions one to two do not show island sensitivity. This is again Brazilian Portuguese, the high topic construction um, from Martins and Nunez. So you have here these cars seem with agreement. It's important that there is agreement. If there was no agreement, it wouldn't be um, a fracture A type of configuration. Then it would just be a topic or something like that. So, but this is the the uh, configuration that makes it part of our um, domain. So these cars seem um, that, and then the people who bought um, repented. So we have here a pro element. Um, there is no island violation. Um, and uh, in the analysis in this uh, paper, this is some kind of pro element. Um, OK, um, for hyper racing, uh, here is a case with an idiom again. The cow seems that went to the swamp. Um, this is an idiom, things are going south. Uh, or went bad, I'm not sure if South is the right thing to say. Um, so the cow seems that went to the swamp um, is possible, but note that we have no pronoun here, for instance. Um, now, how can we test, what, test whether there is um, uh, island restrictions here? Um, so uh, Renato, uh, our nice commentator actually helped with this. So the cow seems that the fact that went to the swamp, uh, disturbed uh, Renato, that's bad. Um, now, if there was no, if the cow is in the embedded class, this is of course fine. Uh, what we have been doing here is to combine a clear hyper-raising property, which is in particular important for Brazilian Portuguese, where we do have two constructions. We want to distinguish the topic construction. Um, uh, the data are later, but I should say this now, if we had the pronoun here, this example would actually be bad. So idioms distinguish between the topic construction and uh, hyper-raising. If the idiom is possible, it's clearly hyper-raising. Um, and in this case, um, if it's the topic construction, it would be bad because uh, the idiom is not possible. And if it's hyper-raising, it's bad exactly because uh, we get an island violation. Um, okay. So connectivity, um, there are lots of really interesting things that uh, people have discussed. Um, what we mean by connectivity is effect, effects that tie the actual DPA, not the associated pronoun or something like that, to a lower position. Uh, the effects vary greatly across languages. Um, and uh, when we put yes in the table, that is to be understood as that at least some effect has been found. Um, um, 
but there's this caveat about prolapses, which I, again, I can mention later. So among the facts that have been discussed, uh, data for all of this are in the appendix, are case being determined in a position below C, um, tracking a lower trace position via prop the proper binding condition, idiomatic constraints, we have seen that already, binding, uh, putting something in a lower position, and NPI licensing by embedded negation, again, putting something in the lower position. Um, I'm illustrating this here with just uh, two examples. Um, this is Korean. Korean, remember, has prolapses and RTO. And what we find is that in the first case, there is um, no island sensitivity. And in the second case, there is. Um, so this is also a case of case stacking. So I believe um, my land begins from here. So you see here from is the case or preposition that comes from the embedded clause. And then there is stacked accusative on top, which indicates RTO. And that's uh, fine in the language. But if we now take the remnant complement clause, um, we get ungrammaticality. So there is a trace in the thing that's moved. Um, that's a typical proper binding condition violation. Um, and this construction can only uh, work with uh, movement because from here, from here is not referential and cannot uh, is not compatible with the prolapsus structure. Um, here would be a prolapsus structure. Jelly, uh, Jelly's father uh, was rich. Uh, I remember about Jelly that his father was rich, and you see that movement here is is uh, much better at least. Um, second case connectivity, I think a, a really knockdown uh, a case that shows that um, in hyper racing we do not, or racing to object, uh, there is no case deficiency comes from this purse, because um, you see here examples where different um, embedded arguments agree with the matrix verb, and the case of these arguments is determined by the argument structure of the embedded verb. Well, transitivity, so here it's ergative because it's the subject, here it's nominative because it's intransitive, and here it's accusative because it's um, the object of a transitive verb. So um, that clearly shows that the DP is in the embedded class. All right, so our approach, um, what we suggesting for construction uh, one and construction two, recall that the difference between one and two is again where DPA is generated. In uh, construction one, it's in the matrix clause in, in the RP, and in construction two, um, it's uh, in this case uh, high up in the embedded CP. So it's uh, in the CP, but not lower down there. Um, this is a topic based generated topic construction, which is associated with a pronoun. And in prolepsis, we have this operator that's associated with a pronoun. And we assume that this is done via unselective binding, which is not subject to um, islandhood. But in three to five, there is actual movement. That's why we get um, island uh, restrictions as well as connect connectivity effects. In these constructions, there are no uh, real connectivity effects. All right, now um, distinction C and D, um, putting those together because they give us a three-way split, which makes, uh, I think, sense to discuss together. So in addition to islandhood, um, we have also looked at A minimality. So whether the thing that moves has to be the closest A position. And what you see here is that uh, among the movement languages, there is a split. Um, configuration three does not show A minimality. Configurations four and five do. Um, and uh, then we'll be talking about semantic properties. And there it's three and four patterning together against uh, uh, case five. So um, in CES, for instance, we do not find uh, minimality effects, a minimality effects. This is an example we saw already. Long distance agreement happens with the object, which is lower than, at least in the surface structure, lower than a subject. Um, the same is the case in Korean. Um, this phrase has to be a major subject, which doesn't have to be the uh, grammatical subject. Um, and once again, it can become a major subject across another subject. And in Brazilian Portuguese, um, this is the construction with the pronouns. Um, these teachers seem agreement again that Mary likes them. That's uh, perfectly fine as well. 
Now, in all the other languages, Romanian, Nespers, Mongolian, Buryat, we do get closest A position effects. Um, let me just do one. I haven't done um, Mongolian too much yet. So let's just look at this example. Um, Ajarel said that, um, um, okay, D um, uh, has a new house. And you can see here that you can have, um, you cannot have accusative here. So the lack of accusative effectively means nominative. So you can only get nominative for the subject. But if um, the if the accusative is scrambled, a scrambled um, to a, a, a higher a position, then uh, nominative or accusative are, are possible. So a minimality is not a subject restriction. It's a restriction that the closest, uh, the highest argument has to get um, into uh, the range of the embedded CP. All right, uh, and lastly, semantic restrictions, because I wanna make sure that I uh, still get to the account uh, of the last part. So in several languages, DPA must be a topic. Um, in Brazilian Portuguese, this has been extensively argued in Martins and Nunez and other works. So for instance, this is our um, favorite cow again. Um, and this is the example I mentioned already, the cow seems that it went to the swamp is bad. Um, or if you take elements that are clearly non-topics, like uh, certain quantificational elements, then they are fine in the hyper-raising construction, but not in the high-topic construction. How do we distinguish? So in this case, again, the high-topic construction occurs with a pronoun. It would not have island uh, restrictions, et cetera. Um, and hyper-raising uh, has no pronoun. The pronoun would be ungrammatical in hyper-raising. And you can see you can't have both. You can have either a quantificational subject but then it must be hyper-raising or it could be um, a topic, but then you can't have a quantificational subject. Um, says, I think the Polinsky and Potsdam uh, generalization is very well known, so I'm gonna not go into this. With one exception here, um, so in says the element that agrees with the matrix verb has to be a topic. And there could, this could be marked with a topic marker. And what you can actually see here is that when you do have the topic marker, agreement becomes obligatory. Um, you can't have the default agreement here. This again goes to what I said at the beginning that uh, the uh, factor A constructions have an obligatory A dependency. What's not obligatory is that this is a topic. Uh, when it's not a topic, then um, um, it, there's no agreement, but um, when there is a topic, agreement is obligatory. And uh, Romanian works like Brazilian Portuguese in terms of the characteristics that quantifiers cannot be used uh, in this construction. Um, all right, um, Korean, yeah, there's very detailed and interesting discussions in, in Yoon, uh, arguing that the DP must be a major subject, uh, which has a range of properties such as a preference for generic. Um, um, there's certain uh, restrictions to uh, individual level predicates, um, and it has to be very salient. Um, and this is very similar to the specificity restrictions that we had before, and similar things have also been noted in Japanese that when you have a quantifier like someone, it has to be interpreted as specific in, um, uh, in these constructions, in the uh, accusative constructions, um, but not in the nominative constructions. Um, I think these are too many data, so I'm, I'm gonna now go to the account here. Um, we have seen that we have um, a, the distinction C and D yield a three-way split. Um, we have here um, all pearl, we have here green and pearl, and here we have green. And our main proposal is that this reflects three ways of how probing is established. Uh, and we'll call those conjunctive, separate dependent, and separate independent. Um, so following recent literature, that looks at composite probes. So probes that have two properties, in our case, A bar and A. Um, there are various suggestions out there. And what we are saying is that they are all kind of right, um, but that it, 
that it may differ from language to language. So there is a kind of a hierarchy of probes that we have developed, in particular Magdalena Loninger, um, who's one of the co-authors here. Um, so let's go through this piece by piece, um, description here and the trees. So conjunctive satisfaction um, means that there is one single um, probe, the A bar and A form one element essentially, and they probe together. And that means um, that they only look for things that have both properties. Um, below, I'll come back to A minimality, but um, uh, in, in this case, conjunctive probing, anything in between here would be irrelevant. Um, uh, CR here just looks for something that has both the A bar and the A properties. Then we have uh, four and five have uh, non-conjunctive, so separate uh, probes. And we indicate this here either with the slash or fully uh, different uh, elements. So let's go to type four. Here we have one single probe with two separately probing segments. Um, and the idea here is that one segment alone cannot trigger movement or agreement, but it can actually block uh, something further. So this is a kind of a, a very um, uncooperative probe. Uh, it doesn't really um, help, but it can uh, distract uh, certain things. So once again, the result, the basic result looks like it's the same. Uh, it, uh, the probe looks for an element that has both features, but we'll see one difference uh, uh, just when we look at the minimality effect. Um, and lastly, we have independent satisfaction. There's two separate probes. They can probe separately and trigger movement and agreement independently of each other. So this is illustrated here. A can look for something and pull this up. And then A bar could in principle probe for something else. Um, so how does this relate to A minimality and semantics? Um, so in um, conjunctive satisfaction, the composite probe has to find a goal which satisfies both features. I'm just going to look at the trees here. Um, so it looks for something with both features, and it doesn't care what's in between. And this uh, shows you that a minimality can be violated, uh, or at least on the surface uh, be violated. There is an interme intermediate A element, but this probe doesn't care about it because it doesn't have all the features. That's why we don't get a minimality here. Uh, and here we see the difference between the, the conjunctive probe and the separate but uh, dependent probe. So these probes separately, um, but still somewhat dependently, um, both probe segments have to find the same element in order for CCA to be possible. Otherwise, this leads to what uh, Kuhn and Kaine call feature gluttony. Um, so there's too many uh, features involved here. So this is actually blocked. This element blocks uh, probing something else um, uh, and effectively, uh, therefore, it will only succeed if the highest element has both features. Um, that's one difference. And lastly, um, we have very strict uh, A minimality. Um, the probes probe separately. The A probe finds the highest element carrying an A feature, which is then moved um, regardless of whether it has an A bar feature or not. So. Um, put together with the semantic restrictions for the conjunctive satisfaction, we get semantic restrictions because um, CC, the CR looks for an A element and something with the relevant semantic properties. Um, the probe can successfully target only an element which has both suitable A and A bar features. Dependent satisfaction, we also find semantic restrictions because the probe segments need to target the same element in order for movement to happen. This element has to have both of the uh, features that are necessary here. Um, and lastly, in this case, we don't find semantic restrictions because the two probes um, target different elements. Um, and so this element doesn't have to have the, the semantic restrictions uh, that C has. Um, so lastly, the optionality of um, uh, fracture A configuration. Uh, we have shown now how successful probing leads to CCA configurations. Um, but uh, following Preminger, 
we also assume that uh, failed probing does not uh, cause a derivation, but it simply results in a non-CCA configuration. And this is listed uh, in detail here. I'm just going to go through one of them. So for conjunctive satisfaction, if the probe succeeds, the targeted element is moved to spec CPR and we get CCA. If the probe fails, then no element is moved um, uh, and there is no CCA. And that accounts for the alternation we have, in fact, for all the constructions um, that CCA, in, including prolepsis actually, um, always uh, alternates with a, uh, an alternative configuration. All right, so quick summary, what um, uh, is doing the main work, distinction A, um, restricted distribution is RP versus CPR. CPR is special, needs to be uh, trained, selected. Um, distinction B, movement, um, base generated position is above C. Um, there is no movement in the embedded clause or it's below C, there is movement. Um, so we get uh, connectivity and um, island effects. A minimality, there's either no movement when there's no A minimality, or movement um, as a result of conjunctive probing. Um, and yes, um, if there are minimality effects, then movement is the result of separate probing. And lastly, semantic restrictions. Uh, if yes, then there is no movement or movement as the result of non-independent probing. And if no, there is independent probing. Um, uh, general conclusions and implications. There is variation quite a lot, um, but it is systematic. And that's always something very nice. Um, different approaches, so all the approaches we cited, we have actually incorporated their main insights. So they are all right, um, um, but where we disagree maybe with some of the approaches is that um, these kind of um, uh, factor A configurations need very different accounts in different languages. Um, we have suggested that prolepsis and CCA are actually much more similar than often thought, and the unifying factor is R. Um, in many languages, there's more than one configuration possible. Teasing apart those is not always easy, uh, sometimes not even possible. But if, um, despite all this variation and uh, difference across languages, I think if we follow these four characteristic properties that we develop, then I think um, a lot of the inconsistencies are cleaned up. And and uh, it allows actually for further very specific uh, testing and comparison across languages. All right, so thank you very much. Um, and sorry for rushing through things a little bit. <laughs> Unmute. All right, <laughs> that, was, that was long time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Susie, for, uh, for your talk, for being here today. It's always good to see how you've put together so many different constructions, so many different languages. And in the end, it boils down to a very simple, uh, oh. uh, complex, but simple mechanism. Uh, it is really good. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm a big fan of your work. Uh, we do have a few questions. I'm going to go... Uh, into the chat in just a minute. I'm going to start with a question of my own, uh, yes. which is first, not much of a question, but a request for you to very briefly summarize what R is. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the nature of R? You, you based it, uh, your idea is based on Ben Dickens' uh, relator uh, operator, relator head, mm -hmm. uh, in a segue mm -hmm. to my first actual question. What is R? Mm -hmm. So it could actually be a real could be filled. That's what then they can show in certain languages. Um, I'm not so sure that this is, well, in many of the languages, there's a complementizer. So maybe it could be part of CPR, CR. Um, but it's really a, um, a semantic function that um, maybe you can think of it as kind of similar to little v. Um, that relates a predicate with an argument. Um, and that's the main uh, function that R has. It's really an argument. It's not an argument introducer per se, but it's um, a predication um, enabler. Um, 
Now, when you combine it with C, there could be could be further properties. Um, and R has these semantic properties. Um, and I don't know if, if this has actually been worked out, but the idea is that um, it's not the predication configuration that triggers these properties, but that R contributes to these uh, properties that it has to be specific, referential, uh, et cetera. And that I think could be built very nicely into the R relation. Thank you. So my, my question uh, related to that is, what is the relation that the DPA has with the CR hat or the R hat, right? As you show in many examples, these, uh, this DPA can move and often has to move into the matrix clause, right? So it's not frozen in the CE in the cartographic right. sense, right? So no, we would think CP positions as being criterial and they would have to be interpreted there. Uh, no. But no. it can move, right? It can be based in rated there or moved. Move in, in some languages, I kind of think it may be more common that it stays there, but um, it can stay there or it can move. Whether it moves or not, I think that's really a matter of some EPP feature on little b or something like that. Uh, but it can move, that's certainly clear. Um, but um, the relation, I think is really, again, this predication relation. Um, so R says my specifier is the argument of this predicate. Um, but then CR, there's additional things that come, come to it. Um, so it, and I think it does make sense. Um, uh, topics are, are very good, um, elements in this configuration, I think. Uh, and the literature actually goes back and forth between, so there's a uh, Rothstein, for instance, um, has this definition that topics are necessarily specific uh, or something like that. So that really goes together very well. Uh, and that's why probably C and R do bundle um, easily when, they, when the language allows that. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I think it's really an A relation that R says, I want an argument um, and then pulls up an argument um, and uh, that interacts then with the other part, the C part, the A bar part, and you know they get into their quarrels of whether they do it together or separately. But uh, the yeah. R part is really just uh, pulling up an A element. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Great, great. Uh, thank you. Uh, before, I do have a few more questions that I'm gonna go and check the, the chat first. Okay. Uh, Janaina Carvalho uh, has oh. a question. Uh, oh. You do know her. <laughs> I, I do know her, yes. <laughs> uh, so she asked, regarding the semantic restrictions to DPs in prolapses, what would be the explanation for the licensing of generic DPs as in 6A? The accounts presented speak of a referential specific DP. So referential or... Uh, so ref but it can't be just referential because in many languages, uh, quantifiers can also occur in prolapses, uh, and quantifiers are not referential. Mm -hmm. um, so for for generic, I think there 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 may be semantic literature that treats it in a sense as as um, uh, as I don't know if it's referential, but um, certainly whenever you you look at um, uh, generic, then it patterns with the specific elements. Um, it goes very well in, in prolepsis. I believe of birds that they are cute. Um, so uh, I, I, I really don't know the semantics. I should not say anything, but I do know that um, uh, when it's about argument movement, for instance, whether something is interpreted within or outside the, the VP, then the mm -hmm. generic are usually the ones, I guess, um, that, that are outside. So it patterns with the specific ones, but there are uh, whether, what semanticists think about uh, referentiality and generics, I would leave that to them. Um, I was just uh, saying that um, uh, just referentiality is not gonna be uh, enough unless uh, generics can be seen as referential in some way. Um, so that was more like a list and not necessarily mm -hmm. a, a, a class, a mm -hmm. single class, yep. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, I'm going to go in order. So Janaina has one more question. Uh, <laughs> adapting Martinez and Nunes' analysis, would we say that CPR is available in languages where C is weak, uh, is a weak phase, which allows for it to be extended? 
So we we don't believe that the different facial status um, is going to cover the whole spectrum. And the reason is that when you look at DPs other than the one that enters the predicate relation, um, they are frozen or they are uh, in a bar position. So the CP seems like a regular a bar CP. It's just this predication relation that opens up the, the, the DP that enters the predication relation uh, for access for further A relations. Um, so in that sense, uh, mm -hmm. weak phases um, doesn't quite work uh, for the entire spectrum. Uh, I'm not saying that it doesn't work for Brazilian Portuguese, but again, we are trying to have this uniform account. Um, and it also may be at odds with the fact that case is determined um, in the embedded clause in, in many languages mm -hmm. where you can actually see it. So there again, a weak phase uh, or a weak or deficient T or C um, is, is, I think, uh, not going to allow uh, ext to extend uh, the analysis to all the constructions. Uh, so thank you, Janaina, for your questions. Uh, moving on, uh, we have Tatiana Bondarenko. Oh, uh, Tanya. <laughs> Hi. You do know her as well? <laughs> I do. <laughs> so she asks, for languages in which the DP has to be a topic, does the conjunctive satisfaction predict that there should still be a minimality of as long as more than one DP in the domain is a topic. Yes, and I believe that uh, there should be data from Turkish that show that it's always the highest topic that triggers um, uh, RTO in Turkish. So yes, uh, I'm not sure there may even be data in CES, but, uh, but definitely minimality, but um, uh, it's still the closest mm -hmm. because it is a probing relation uh, that has both features. Um, but not the closest A element. Yes, uh, if mm -hmm. that came across, yeah, uh, that's that's good. I'm, it, I, it didn't mean that there is no minimality. Um, uh, there is clearly minimality if there is uh, movement, um, but uh, the the target or the the intervening elements for minimality differ in the conjunctive probing and in the in the separate probing. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. a very important clarification. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one nice thing to ask there would be. Uh, whether different kinds of topic interfere with each other, right? Mm -hmm. uh, especially in, in, in approaches where different kinds of topic must move to different specifiers, mm -hmm. right? They either agree related yeah. with different ads, yeah. so in principle, they should interfere with each yeah. other. Let's do it, Renato. <laughs> <laughs> Your language <laughs> offers itself. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, and I'll learn some Turkish so we can work on that. <laughs> Good. <laughs> thank, you. Uh, thank you, Tatiana, for, for your question. Uh, and finally, from the chat, we have uh, Kafai Yip. Uh, it seems that semantic restrictions have two kinds on the verbs, uh, example, uh, for example, belief related, and on the moving DP, for example, topic reading. Could I ask how this account may explain the restriction on the verbs? Okay, so uh, it explains that via the selection. So, in order to get for prolepsis, there shouldn't be too many restrictions, although there could be if, if languages are more restricted, but in general prolepsis per se does not have uh, verb restrictions uh, other than that it requires a proposition. Um, but for a CPR, um, the verbs, the specific verbs actually select whether you can get a CPR um, complement. Uh, so that's really built in, into the verbs. Um, there could be subclasses, but uh, we, we are not quite sure yet because the literature is really a little vague about that. Um, it is kind of striking that the classes that allow CPR best are the knowledge and perception verbs. 
If we look into the Cinque hierarchy, those are the lowest ones in the CP. So that may have mm -hmm. something to do with it. But um, given that there then are languages where speech verbs also allow CPR, uh, it's difficult to have a, 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 a strong semantic restriction on it. Um, and that's why we have shifted this to a, a lexical restriction of verbs, because it's also not mm -hmm. all verbs of a particular class that allow CPR. It's it's quite restricted. It's um, uh, and there's also a lot of speaker variation. So I, I think the semantics there doesn't do too much. Um, it's really a syntactic lexical restriction, whereas the topic one um, um, may be related to the nature of this construction um, more. Um, we haven't really fully worked that out either, but there is ways one could think about it. Mm -hmm. Thank Good. you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Fai, for your question. Um, I have one more question, which is related to the TP being the predicate selected by CR or R, right? Uh, you get the proposition, the, the fully saturated proposition at the CP level. So given right. the structure bottom up, one would expect it to be fully saturated already at the TP, right? So something has to happen to hold off that saturation. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I have said yeah. something along those lines uh, myself in the past, like your delay saturation, but I was oh, wrong. Okay. That idea came up. Yeah. I was wrong on, so, uh, on very but good point. Um, yeah. Um, uh, Eva Kovac actually thought about this as well. Um, I think the way we are probably at the moment looking at this is that um, we, it's not that CR selects the TP. Um, in fact, we don't really want to have this kind of selection. We just want to say, well, you put it together. Um, any TP can be can combine with C or CR as long as the end result comes out OK. So if you have CR and the TP, those two would not be interpretable. But nothing in the syntax is worried about this, right? Mm -hmm. um, just when you then get to the CP, then you realize, no, there is something that, that doesn't work. Um, so at the end, um, if you have CR, then it must relate um, an argument with uh, a predicate. And one can see this sort of a little bit as maybe the trigger for movement. So the A property of, of CR really says, I want an argument here um, and uh, thereby creating the, the predicate. Um, predicate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's sort of the, the idea here. So it's it wouldn't be the T itself, but the combination of C and T that creates the predicate and C bar would yeah. be the ET type. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I guess one could do this. Either there's two ways of doing it. Either CR is itself a kind of a lambda operator that uh, makes mm -hmm. the predicate or uh, after movement, this happens that it becomes a predicate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's it's more like an output condition that CR has to mediate between an argument and the predicate, um, and mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't select a predicate. But the, the mediation has to work. So the semantics of uh, R is um, I want to relate a, an argument and the predicate, and that only works if when this relation. Uh, uh, happens, there has to be a predicate, but it doesn't say you have to be a predicate from the beginning. Mm -hmm. That's good. Uh, no, actually, that clarifies some of our thinking as well. Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, thank you, Susie. Uh, we, I don't see any more questions uh, in the chat. Okay. Uh, thank you very much thank for you. sharing your work with us today, sharing your time. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. It was okay. always a, good, a great pleasure. Uh, and for everybody watching, uh, please stay tuned for more talks, more events. Go to abrolin.org, go to abrolin uh, on social media, and please be there for more talks and more events. Thank you. Bye-bye, Susie. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>